Welcome to this video on bipedalism part two. So in the last video, we looked at how when the environment changed to a savanna environment, then bipeds had a bunch of advantages over the quadrupeds. We also looked at some of the physical differences. But that was one and a half million years ago that we were quadrupeds, and now we're bipeds. A lot more than this has changed. So in this video, we're going to look at some of the other changes that have occurred in that time. Most importantly, the changes to the skull. And we're also going to mention a couple of other changes which are good to know about. So before we delve into the details of the skull changes, remember that an improved diet over time led to bigger brains. And our skull needed to adjust to account for this. But not just for the bigger brain, also because of the food. So let's look at an older skull from a quadruped and compare that to our bipedal skulls right now. The first of five differences that you need to know is that back when we were quadrupeds, we had what's called a sagittal crest. It's a crest of bone that runs right down the middle of our skull. It's hard to see on this angle, and we don't have a sagittal crest right now. But if you look at other primate skulls, you can see that there's a massive bony ridge right down the middle of the skull here. So it looks a lot like a mohawk for the skull. Now the second change is what's called big zygomatic arches. So these are the arches that come out behind your cheekbones. So they're bigger back when we were quadrupeds, and they're smaller now. And it's hard again to see on this angle, but you'll notice here on quadrupeds, they stick out quite a lot. They're big. Versus on humans, they barely stick out at all behind the cheekbones. So we have smaller zygomatic arches now. We also used to have prominent brow ridges. Now we have smaller brow ridges. So that's your eyebrows used to pop out a whole lot more than they do now. We used to have a prognathic jaw which is a protruding jaw, whereas now our jaws are a lot flatter in our faces. And you can see that in chimpanzees now where their jaws stick out from the front of their face compared to ours are flatter in the front of our faces. And finally, we had a smaller cranium. Now, cranium is the space inside your skull where your brain lives. So it used to be about 400 cc's or cubic centimeters, which is about the same as 400 mils of water, whereas now it's closer to 1400 cc's or 1400 mils of water, 1.4 liters. So these are the five major changes. And all these changes come down to the fattier diets and the bigger brains. So the first thing you need to know is that lots of fat makes it easy to chew. So that's why we have a smaller jaw. But in addition to that, we also needed smaller jaw muscles. And every piece of bone that sticks out on your head, whether it's a sagittal crest, a zygomatic arch, your big brow ridge, or anything else, is for a muscle to attach to. So if you need weaker muscles because you're chewing, fats, which are easier to chew, then you only need smaller arches, ridges, and brows. So that's why our arches, ridges, and brows have decreased. In addition to that, eating fattier foods will help feed your brain. So your brain grows faster, it's a lot bigger, and not having all these ridges and arches allows more room for the brain. That's why the cranium, the space inside your skull, has increased from 400 cc's up to 1400 cc's. And to wrap up some more on the development of the brain, one of the best developments that we had as bipeds was the ability to produce better sounds so we can articulate language a lot more clearly, we can make a wide range of sounds of highs and lows, we can mimic people, and we can also interpret sound as well. So that's why the fattier diets lead to bigger brains and that led to all of these changes in the skull. The next thing we need to look at are the other changes that occurred in that one and a half million years or so. So the first of those is hair. We used to be a lot more hairy than we are. So living in a hot environment, we didn't need hair as much. We also, standing up, gained a lot better temperature control. That's thermoregulation. So we lost the need for hair. Other changes were in sexuality. For primates, they're reproductive their whole lives. An elderly primate can have offspring. Whereas elderly females now can't have offspring. They're not reproductive. Women go through menopause and then they can no longer have children after that. Now, looking at the offspring themselves now, rather than the parents, the offspring are also quite different. So young primates are more advanced when they're born, and they develop very quickly. So within one year old, they're largely self-sufficient, whereas offspring of Homo sapiens are born less advanced, and they develop really slowly. I mean, often it's 17 or 18 years before people even learn about human evolution. So what you need to know from this video is that comparing our old quadruped state to our current biped state, we have some differences in the skulls. So those differences are a smaller jaw now because we're chewing fattier foods which are easy to chew. We no longer have a sagittal crest, that's that mohawk of bone going right up the middle of our skulls, because we don't need those big muscles to attach to it anymore. The same logic goes from smaller zygomatic arches. 
We don't need big jaw muscles attaching to them anymore, therefore they've gotten a lot smaller. We also had a big brow ridge again for attaching muscles, and finally we've had a larger cranium now than we used to, so the larger space holding the brain. And the other changes we looked at, well we used to be hairier than we are, now we're more hairless. Also, back when we were quadrupeds, we were sexually reproductive for the whole lifespan, males and females, whereas now females are no longer sexually reproductive later on in life. So the final thing we looked at was that offspring, they used to be born more advanced and develop very quickly, whereas now offspring are born less advanced and take a lot longer to develop. Let's look at the practice question now. In this question, we've given a scenario at the top here and then three points that we're going to need to write about in our answer. So let's read the scenario and look at them one by one. So the scenario. Recent evidence indicate that a single gene mutation resulting in weakened jaw muscles may have been significant in the early evolution of hominins. This is because changes to muscle anatomy can also alter the bones to which those muscles attach. So we need to relate the significance of weakened jaw muscles and changes in skull structure to human biological evolution. So in our answer specifically, what we need to do is number one, describe changes in the skull structure that actually occurred. Then we're gonna to need to explain how the change in jaw anatomy may have influenced changes to skull structure. And finally, evaluating the implications of those changes of skull structure to further human evolution in terms of the brain. So let's go through those one by one, starting off with describing the changes in skull structure. We looked at those five differences in skull structure. So what you need to do when it says to describe, you don't need to give any explanation or background, you need to list what you know. So putting these five differences in a sentence would look like changes to the skull structure are a reduction in jaw size, a loss of that sagittal crest, a reduction in the zygomatic arch size behind the cheekbone, loss of the protruding jaw, and a larger cranium space for the brain. And you could put, if you remember, that it went from about 400 cc's to about 1400 cc's. So those are the main differences in the skull. And that's what you want to write for a sentence like that. Next, you'll need to explain how that change in jaw anatomy may have influenced changes to the whole skull. So again, we need to look at our skulls. Now we need to explain, not just describe what the difference is, why eating different food led to all of these changes in the brain. So putting that into a sentence, we can say that we changed our diet so that the food was easier to chew. So that's why we have a smaller jaw and then in turn, the jaw muscles became weaker because it's easier to chew the food now. So that means all of those protrusions, the brow ridges, the zygomatic arches, and the sagittal crest, they're no longer required for that muscle attachment. So therefore, the features decrease in size, those bone protrusions, and that's why we have the differences that we've seen. So now I've gone one step further than just describing what there is, we've also explained why those features were there. And then finally, we need to evaluate the implications of these changes to further human biological evolutions in the brain. So again, we know that that improved diet led to our bigger brains, and that's a change in dietary function actually fed our brains a lot more with the fatty foods. So therefore, we can say changing to those softer foods, those fattier foods, high in fat and protein, meant that the jaw muscles became weaker. So without those large jaw muscles and their bony attachments, the skull is no longer restricted and held in place because you don't need all those extra features taking up space. So therefore, the cranium can enlarge from 400 cc's to 1400 cc's. So that larger brain, as we learned in the previous video, part one, creates a positive feedback loop. You can improve the diet because you're smarter, which means a bigger brain, which means better food, and the cycle continues on. So that's what you'd write for the final part of evaluating the implications of those changes in skull structure. So if you were to put all of those three sentences together, or those three paragraphs together, this is what it would look like as a final answer. Again, just describing the changes that we've learned about, explaining the impact on the structure, and then evaluating how it actually affected the brain. And this is Bipedalism Part 2.